introduce our chief guest for the event, Mr. Mathi Sharan Gupta, National President, Crime Free Branch Mission, and former DGP Madhya Pradesh. Sir is an IPS officer of the 1984 batch of Madhya Pradesh Kaluk. Sir is currently appointed as Special DG Police Reform, Madhya Pradesh. He is a M Tech in Industrial Engineering from IIT Delhi and is skilled in Operations Management, Analytical Skills, and Team Building. Sir has a special interest in automation and innovation, which is clearly reflected in the current projects he is heading. He is currently heading automated. Investigation support system with the use of 21 technologies to pave way to crime-free India, empowering railway passengers through integrated All India GRB Health App Suit, State Disaster Command Response and Monitoring System to create disaster-capable and resilient India using predictive, proactive warning system, mobilizing of local resources. Shifting population under risk to safer location using period for infotainment and capacity building, automated data, information, and documents requisitioning and assimilation systems are a few to mention. It's an honor, sir, to have you today with us. I would like to request Mathi, sir, to please address the audience. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, such a uh, elaborate introduction, and uh, I feel probably. Uh, I, I would like to thank uh, Galgotia University for uh, having invited me to join this important uh, forum and to, I mean, participate in this agora, uh, which is uh, basically very close to my heart of crime-free Bharat. Uh, to begin with, uh, uh, Honorable Professor Dr. Preeti Bajaj, Vice Chancellor of Galgotia University, uh, Dr. Bentes. So thank you very much for uh, having invited for this session. Probably I am having a lot many things to say with all you, and probably that might set a uh, tone for how the forensic should uh, move forward. Because I find a lot of problems, and uh, with my vast experience of the policing, including six, six and a half year as a DGP, uh, probably in the different uh, domain as a DG uh, railway, uh, Madhya Pradesh. DG Hongars Civil Defence and uh, Disaster Management, and DG Police Reform. Uh, first of all, uh, we would not be uh, doing a right kind of analysis unless we are uh, aware of what kind of the problem is being faced on ground by the forensic scientists, by the people at large, by the investigator, and uh, including their. Emotional and uh, related things. So uh, things have to be understood in a totality, and we have to really devise solution to make it happen. Because whatever we are taking it from outside India, from abroad, their problem is very minuscule if we compare them with Indian problems. So their solution is almost failure in India. their machinery which is capable of doing some test few test that is also not really good enough to resolve our problem so we have to really go in a very big way to remodel our research development remodel our way of reaction we have to devise our own way our own model our own methodology i am of the very considered view the present way of handling crime present way of providing forensic assistance is there's a lot of gaps and uh, whatever we are doing little bit here and there that is not going to solve our problem so uh, the first problem which has been brought to my notice by forensic students when they said that uh, uh, though there are 82 uh, more than 82 universities are there and institutes are there who are offering a specialized subject specialized topics on forensic science but recruitment rule of fsl and uh, senior scientific officer and scientific officer it is basically not revised so still they are taking people from basic science it is something like do we are having that expert mds and dms still we are going for mbbs because the recruitment rule provides for the mbbs it's something like that 
So the first and foremost, this, then it was uh, really brought to the notice of the concerned quarter. A formal letter of has gone from uh, MHA and uh, various states, uh, they are in the process of revising their recruitment rule. I am very sure in times to come, within a few months, uh, the recruitment rule would be revised across the India and the forensic scientists, they will be having better opportunity to deliver things. But I am having something else to really offer because I feel uh, there is a not really a question of uh, going for forensic scientists uh, on the government approved list. Brother, I would like to have the thousands and lakhs of forensic scientists, senior experts who should act as a freelance. And the thing should be now more system oriented, more procedure oriented rather than by the whimsical approach adopted by anybody. I mean, whether it is IO, IO or the senior functionary of the police department. So many states are not having fully developed organizational structure to provide field support in, uh, to the IOs. However, Madhya Pradesh is lucky because it is having a fully elaborate uh, system. Uh, it is having uh, all uh, branches of FSL. Uh, it has it is having the specialization also. We are having DNA laboratories. We are having the regional DNA laboratories also. And uh, all districts, they are having uh, mobile forensic unit. They are having SSO and SO also. But uh, this is the positive side of the story. I will come and I will tell about the negative side of the story as well. Uh, the biggest problem with the forensic scientists, they themselves are nearly not Johanna, excelling themselves. So they are not enjoying kind of high self-esteem, uh, kind of high confidence level. Uh, and uh, they are generally browbeaten by the people in police hierarchy, including investigating officers. That is not really right interaction, right uh, correlation with the forensic scientists. Uh, there is a lack of faith and a lack of support from senior police functionaries. Forensic scientists are being viewed by many police officers as they are interfering with their discretion. And basically their latitude and their freedom to implicate or absolve somebody under dictate of someone is getting minimized. And somewhere the rent seeking behavior is also getting affected. So many of IOs, they are not really very kind to forensic supports, which is very readily available to them. And they try to avoid, avoid taking help from scientists unless the direction is being issued by the senior police officer or, or if the FC, SP or DIG or IG, they are very proactive and they are highly inclined in favor of the forensic science related and based in investigation. Uh, there is a lack of professionalism. Samples are not being collected properly. Circumstantial evidences which are required to cross verify. Say if you see any, say law, law less uh, compare forensic science like a pathological laboratories. So pathological laboratory after doing the test they will invariably will put a line. It may be, uh, please be verified with the clinical observations. So it means it is having the two aspects. Number one, what the laboratories, what are the tests are saying, and what are the corroboratory evidence from the grounds are available. Unfortunately, uh, those corroboratory circumstantial evidences, evidences from the grounds, they have are not properly collected. There's a lack of protocols. They are a lack of standard operating process. People are just uh, going in many cases by their uh, wisdom, by their uh, experiences, but less of the things are being codified. Rather, it is a highly specialized subject. And this kind of uh, lack of standardization cannot and should not be tolerated. Uh, as I said in the beginning, 
that majority of the machines, whether it's a DNA or others, they are being imported. They are very costly. They are having very limited uh, capacity and their results have not been really verified in Indian context. So we need to have our own research and development. We have to really do the lot of reprocess re-engineering. And this kind of the limited testing has to be converted into the mass testing. And lot many concepts which I will be elaborating later on need to be incorporated. Oh, there are other issues. So uh, not collecting sample properly, missing out lot many things. Uh, my friend, uh, uh, he has gone in great detail and giving the details, the five principles. But those principles uh, and evidences are not meticulously collected by, by the investigator. And uh, so because of that very reason, uh, uh, there is a there is a there is an issue. Uh, the police not properly collecting it, not properly sealing it, taking it to the thana. It is lying in thana for a very long time. Whenever there is a supervisory reminder, then it is sent to FSL or testing laboratories, where in eighty to ninety percent cases it is declared that it is not fit for testing. That kind of the situation would not happen if we directly from a spot, it should be sent to the FSL level. So if we are having subsidiary services, may not be necessarily coming from uh, SSO or SO. They may come from the private sector. They may come through the startup and there will be strong performance appraisal and grading system. Probably that will create more jobs, that will create uh, more expertise, that will create uh, and at the same time, it will not allow the deviation because each and every case will be, uh, there will be performance evaluation, there will be grading, and then there will be a, a CGPS kind of things where the integrated pro, uh, proficiency or efficiency index would be calculated. And uh, the payment or revenue line will be somewhere would be calculated based on the performance index. So there will be a pressure to maintain the right kind of the protocols, right kind of the processes, right kind of uh, their own standard. And there will be a lot of research oriented work, which is at the moment is uh, leaking. So uh, like I thought we have uh, say in crime free Bharat, we have created one law institute, I mean draft institute, which says national authority for scientific and technical assistance in investigation and detection of crime. And it's a, the basic purpose is to provide scientific and technical assistance to the investigator. And it is a part of legal and constitutional responsibility of the central government. And whatever is the constitutional responsibility, it cannot be discretion of anybody else. So, and at the same time, now there's a concern about the privacy so this one of the important purpose of this national authority to really guarantee right to the privacy. So right to privacy, which should not be for the authority. It should be in position to capture each and everything which is required for the detection and for the prevention and finally for the rehabilitation of criminals. I will say this authority should be, should be creating a technological chitra. I, ho I hope my friends, they understand Chitragup, mythological Chitragup. So when we die, Chitragup during the period, he keeps uh, details and videos of all whatever you are doing. And after your death, when you reach over, reach, uh, so there's a, some kind of a court system where the Chitragup will be uh, sharing your videos with you. And then you will be given an opportunity to react and thereafter it will be decided what should be your fate and whether you will be getting the next worth or not. I mean, that kind of the uh, mythological belief that there is something like a Chitragut. Now we need to create this technological Chitragut who would be having every minutest details about everyone for each soul. But the detail will not be and will not be available to any third party. Only there is a deviation, it can be used in court of law 
for proving your guilt or innocence. So, we must not use the privacy to weaken our system. Privacy should be used for guaranteeing, and privacy should be uh, it should be available to the people so that it should not be shared for any commercial purpose. It should not be shared with any third party. Rather, sharing with anybody who is not supposed to have that information, it would be a very, very heinous offense. It will be a cognizable offense. It will be non available offense with very, very difficult bail provisions. And it would be having minimum punishment of seven years. So the chairman of National Authority for Scientific and Technical Assistance, if he deviate and use any piece of information for the unintended purpose, the same person chairman would be landing himself in the jail because he violated privacy. That kind of the law we are talking. Now, there's a, when there's a digital data, there will be intruders, there are ethical hackers, there are this and that. So there is a a powerful system which is catering for the physical security and that is catering for the digital security, firewalls, encryption, this, that. Crossing that firewall and reaching to the database of the crime-free Bharat under National Authority of Scientific and Technical Assistance under NT65C, Schedule 7 of the Constitution would not be doable by any hacker unless he risk his life in the jail. So there will be inbuilt log analysis. The moment any ethical hacker even attempt to enter into the system, his identity would be identified. The evidence of his uh, entering into the system would also be identified. And this will be a very, very serious offense as we are talking of uh, that any uh, uh, insider, if he's sharing that info, uh, information. So any outsider, whether he is an ethical author or unethical author or he is a criminal or he is a non-criminal, does not matter. You are not supposed to enter inside the database of the CMB. And if you do that, you are committing a very, very serious offense. That will be again uh, a cognizable offense, non available offense, very, very difficult bail provision with minimum punishment of seven years. And the system at the back end is capable of capturing the locks, capturing your identity, capturing the evidence of your unethical behavior and fixing you and putting you in the jail. So no hacker, irrespective of any part of the globe, would not be in position to do it. Forget about the Bitcoin, forget about the dark net, forget about the dark web. We have to speak and we have to devise solution with that kind of the confidence. I think we technocrat, we the forensic scientist, we the uh, engineers, we are not devising right kind of the software and hardware solution. We should not become part of the problem. We should become part of the solution. My friend is doable. Uh, so uh, there is a need to uh, really do a lot of re-engineering. We have to really think of how the forensic science can play a dominant role and all investigations should be forensic science based and supported solutions. How, 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 how that can be done? How that can be done? So uh, that, that can be done by modifying our responses and our behavior our protocols and say when an operation can be done by remotely making use of the robotics and other tools by by a doctor sitting at a remote corner maybe in the other part of the world or under his guidance may be done by some local doctor i think it is certainly there's a le with the lesser risk it can be done in the field of the forensic science so there could be forensic scientists, there could be the field scientist of the forensic, there could be the freelance uh, scientist, there could be the vehicle. Let it not be owned by the police department. 
So there could be one startup who will provide services of a very, very standard mobile field unit. It will be having all kind of the facility, all kind of the tools which are required for modern scientific investigation. It will have all kind of the packaging system, all kind of the resources where a, a very advanced packaging is possible. It will be having QR based, uh, three package based system where the samples will be collected and will be sent directly from there, making use of the courier system, not depending on the police, so that samples collected from the scene will not be sent to Thana. It will straight away will go to testing laboratories and there will be plethora of the uh, laboratories. We can develop the credential modality for them. We could develop their performance and gradings and probably uh, there will be a lot of transparency on the other side. I will, I will cover that in details while deliberating on that issue. Uh, so begin with, uh, 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 let me say that uh, the whole thing has to be really converted into say forensic science related evidence collection should start much before the real collection of evidence. So we should go first uh, state or, uh, or first step should be to protect scene of crime. So even we can have the people after the little training that n number of the volunteer of the CFB, which we, we, we see in future because it is having the five revenue streams. So we see the whole population will be our volunteers. So the illegal people could be trained, hence the availability of the people uh, who could who will be the trained volunteers to do the say crime scene protection. They will be having and uh, uh, they can go and they can do that protection and uh, everything would be under the record and uh, they will get uh, the detail for their services. There could be another service, photography service. It will be having the 2D photography, it will be having 3D photography, it will be having IR supported photography, UV supported photography, it will be having the drone photography, it will be having robotic photography. So we, we are in position to create a kind of a situation which generally happens in the cricket stadium where n number of the chaotic kind of rec uh, recording is uh, through the floating camera, fixed camera, drone camera, all, all those cameras. They, those services would be available and through Wi-Fi connectivity, through that, uh, this data will directly go to the cloud and this data will not be Johanna, available to the person who is providing the service. So he will, his job would be only to provide a quality service. He will not have the ownership on the data and his uh, doing the performance would also be evaluated. and. The payment will be made to them on the basis of the index performance index multiplied by whatever the fees fixed for them. So if they are having performance, performance index 0.7 and suppose they are supposed to get say uh, 5,000 rupees for that service. So instead of 5,000, it will be multiplied by index 0.7 and he will be getting only 3,500 uh, rupees instead of 5,000 rupees. So those startup, those service provider, they will be always worried to maintain a high, very high level of standard and uh, we will not be dependent on the permanent bureaucrats, whether they, are, they may be from the forensic experts, the moment they become permanent bureaucrats, their behavior changes, they are having a lot of ego. So why, why we should have them on the permanent role? They should provide the services. There is a no go to provide those services in a less transparent manner. So, so we can have that transparency, we can have date and time and location stamping. There will be hash value protection. Evidences captured would be sent through the blockchain technology and it would be creating proof of chain of custody. It will be creating certificate under 65B of Evidence Act. It will be creating certificate of admissibility as per the law, so that any wrong impression should not be and need not be and could not be created in the court of law. Now, 
there has to be that kind of the mindset so uh, let's presume a situation how i visualize that uh, future of the science uh, uh, forensic science will take place so at the moment i will uh, i will go on the latter part that how the forensic should redesign and do the things and what kind of, now let me look into the administrative part of it delivery part of it and let's change the very gamut of it and and it is doable so uh, i very fondly and i always say that each citizen of india is a police officer in legal term i would like to repeat at this forum also that you are having a legal responsibility not only about the reporting of a cognizable offense but in some some cases even intention to commit crime need to be reported under section 39 crpc uh, you are learned person i would like that you uh, rather than relying on by words i would like you to google it and read for yourself do you know what this law says so you are duty bound to or legal duty bound to report about the commission of offense and even in some certain cases even intention to commit crime and the jurisprudence has been changed for this particular section so when you commit any other crime in that crime the burden of proving beyond reasonable doubt that is on the police and prosecution but in case of the section 39 the burden of proving innocence for not doing the lawful legally duty that proving of innocence lies on the citizen themselves that is the law now let's go to the another most important part of a uh, police that is the arresting criminals so my friend each citizen of india rather each private person is having legal right to arrest a person in a cognizable offense non available offense this right is there even in presence of police so even if the police is present over there is still the private person can arrest person and if the police officer is available over there, uh, over there then that arrested criminal arrested offender he need to be handed over to that police officer who is present on the spot and if no police officer is present on the spot then he has to be taken to the nearest police station and in both the cases whether it is the police officer or when you reached at the police station then in both the cases the it is not the arrest but the police will be doing the rearrest so instead of arrest memo there should be rearrest memo now these nuances unfortunately has not been conveyed to the people i i am really failing to understand after uh, more than 36 year of the service why why you know these things are not really known to public there are very learned people many of you may not be knowing these provisions and when they are such a powerful provision where the burden of proving innocence for not doing the lawful duty also lies on the person why this has not been exploited by the police i very strongly feel this has not been done purposefully so that they can avoid the registration of crime so the police is having the legal duty to whenever any case is reported to them to register the case under section 1541 of crpc so you are having the legal duty police is having the legal duty the pleasure doctrine cannot and should not be there at all my friends i feel you must be knowing that there is a one case called lalta kumari versus state of vp in which uh, apex court has given 5 6 sequel uh, judgment and some total of that judgment is that if content of your reports is revealing that cognizable offense has been committed then police is having no discretion but to register your offense in certain cases when there is some confusion whether the cognizable offense has been committed or not police may inquire 
police will not investigate police can inquire and should inquire within the time frame fixed by the apex court that whether the cognizable offense had been committed or not and the moment on that inquiry it comes to the conclusion that cognizable offense has taken place police is having no discretion but to register the case it is highly jo hai disgusting that still getting fir registered by a private person by a normal citizen by a ordinary citizen is getting day by day very difficult this is uh, must be experience of the people at large if it had been a say interactive session probably many hand would have been raised and probably people would have been having the lot many their own stories and the stories of the kith and kin to say where they tried their level best they have uh, they run from pillar to post but still they could not get their fir registered we are operating in that kind of the scenario somewhere the political interference is there the police which is supposed to register the offense the people are entering into the thana beating the police and the cases are being registered against the police that kind of the big police we are having that kind of the political interference we are having a time has come let's establish it establish rule of law and forensic scientists must play a very dominant role and i am of the strong believe 90 or more than 99% of them they should not be on the payroll of the government so in beginning i said the rules should be revised so forensic scientists should be uh, the eligibility conditions should be changed so instead of basic science the experts for the various kind of the things should be uh, taken and rule uh, rr rules should be uh, or recruitment rules should be accordingly revised and which are already in process and i i presume that this will be done on the priority basis i am very sure that uh, all state they will be having the field support system to to do that job at the same time i feel that future of india should not be dependent on the government employee this 99% of them they should be freelance journals and there should be transparency in their process everything would be captured digitally now even the comparison where you are using your eyes when where, where, where you, you are using your brain even that could be captured and wherever uh we need we can refer it to the person who is more experienced rather we can devise the protocol where it may be mandatory that whatever has been captured it will be sent to three uh, senior uh, scientist also as uh, who may be freelance and they may be sitting in any part of the globe and their view would be and their things would be taken on the almost on real time basis that will be absolutely un unflushed and the whole process will be acting almost on the real time basis and its admissibility its credibility would be very very high it will be almost infallible offense and uh, infallible evidence and with that kind of the evidence we would be in position to convict everybody so we would be in position to detect 100% cases we would be in position to convict almost 100% cases rather i will say more than 100% cases so you will be surprised so how it is possible that more than 100% cases would be registered so let me tell you i have devised many of the methodology where why we, we will be in position to map the movements and map with the crime committed and we are in position to identify the cases which has been committed either not reported because they were found trivial or not registered by the police driven by the various consideration even those offenses would be detected system would be helping to get your fir registered system would be helping to get all kind of the evidences collected including the forensic evidences it will have all kind of the validation from the research people from the higher level of the people and they could be uh, helped Uh, so that through the app and through the various tools and through the various iot devices so if they are doing something outside even 
there the device could be connected to that uh, equipment and uh, I, uh, it will be talking to our app. So their output, what they are seeing, what they are observing, what their eyes is seeing, that can also be captured and that will go in database. That could be used for the research. Probably, uh, I am not finding a number of the people thinking on those lines. That is, that is really very unfortunate. So, a uh, lot many things are missed. Lot, lot many things are not captured by the investigator because of the he is not having the right kind of skill set. He is not having the right kind of the tool to connect. So, basically, there is a need of having a say photography service. So, first we said there will be a vehicle, and let the vehicle should not be owned by the government. The vehicle we should have the prescription. What kind of the field forensic vehicle should be, and there will be forensic vehicle service provider and he will be getting the remuneration on the basis of the type of the service they are providing and uh, since they are the expert of the field uh, the obsolescence in technology will not be taking place and they, it will be the duty on them to really upgrade their vehicle operate provide all kind of the facility to the vehicle then, then we said there will be two kind of the forensic experts one expert who is employed by the government and 99% will be the freelance experts of the varying degree of the experiences and they will be having their own grading and proficiency index and their services will be procured by in the two way number one by integrating them right in the field in the investigative process and second when the person who may be available on the scene he may not be of the very high level. So, whatever he is capturing, he can capture in the guidance of the senior person may be sitting in any part of the globe. And that capturing will be made available almost to him on the real time basis. The way we are going for the 5G technology, the way we are going for the fiber optics, doing that will become highly doable and present handicap which is being experienced that will not be there on the ground. Here, I would like to stress on photography. So, there will be photography service. Again, it will be in the private hand. Because if it is in the government hand, they might keep it in their malkhana. And probably, IO may not have the interest, access or skill set to use it in the ground. And if it is taken to the ground, probably it may not be functional. So why should be done by government employee? Let the service should come. It will capture and it should have the state of art service, which will be having the drone based service, which will be having the robotic service, which will be having the manual service. It will be capturing 2D, it will be capturing 3D, it will be IR supported photography, UV supported photography. It will be converting the whole scene of crime into the grids and the nothing could be missed from the digital eye. The digital eye would be in position to identify object wherever it is unable, it will push that image to the expert and the expert would be in position to uh, do that. After wearing appropriate uh, gloves, that device can be given to some robot or something like that, where very intricate pictures could be created, could be captured. You must have heard that uh, nowadays everybody is want to give you a realistic feel. Even now, a lot many animated and other kind of the experiences are available uh, with, with the vendors and commercial people are you implying that if a sari hai to kaisi lagegi ye, padana hai to kaisa lagega ye, right? So they are using the manipulation and there are lot, lot many uh, say human body uh, replication, uh, maybe real or maybe uh, digitally created. Those things need to be here. So, there could be a manual and uh, if we are having any clothes of uh, any, any victim, that will go, go on the manual so that we can have the very minute observation. We can even recreate the scene of crime. So, we, we can see that whether it is a real and original or it has been uh, put, on the, put on it. So, 
uh, say if there's a, any flu, whether it is libation or whether it's a blood or whether it's a semen or whatever, it can it, it is not only capturing the substance, it will capture this the pattern, it will capture trickling down effect. And whether it corroborates with the thesis which is available or hypothesis which is available on the scene of crime. And we can have the reconstruction of scene of crime. My friend, we cannot do it as a part. Let's come out with a holistic solution to, 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 to make it happen. And uh, I am very sure, sure that uh, the Galgothia University has taken the step in very right direction where this kind of the thinking should be there. We must not go for a very kind of a passive kind of the presentation where uh, uninteresting things are being discussed. I think we should be bold enough to discuss the ground related problem. We should have this national authority for scientific and technical assistance should provide the data set for the research. If we do not want to say or the privacy issue, this we can suitably camouflage the data. So data originality will be there, but the data is coming from where and whose identity that can be camouflaged and that pure data could be made available to the to the, our technocrats, to our scientists. And we can uh, use the various models which are available uh, of the artificial intelligence, of the machine learning and the deep learning. Probably we would be in position to draw inferences which human eye cannot draw, number one. Number two, wherever the human eye is superior and doing a better job, let the technology will push that data to them and get their uh, integration, get their input so that we are benefited by the technology, we are benefited by the human intelligence also. And both, best of both in an integrated format should be available for uh, society, for nation and for the globe. Let me tell you, there cannot be a better hub for research and development than India. Whether we are talking of capturing CCTV, whether we are talking of investigation of the crime, whether we are talking of the culture, whether we are, whatever we are talking, the grand complexity which is being enjoyed by the Indian, whether it is in the form of a nature, whether it is a form of a weather, whether it is form of a, uh, say, variation in uh, herbs uh, or, or crops or that is nowhere yes, available sir. in other, other part of the globe. Sir, sorry so, for the interruption, but sir, we're running. Uh, out no, time. no, 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 sorry. This is very important for that Agora is being done because I am setting the milestone for you. Please listen it carefully and not yes. only listen it, please do it. Otherwise, this exercise will become academic exercise. I will plead, don't don't try to tie, tie up, uh, say, uninteresting Joanna's presentation. They have been Joanna, given so much of the time. And please allow me to complete because I want to set the tone for this Agora. I want to, then I will tell how I can really facilitate it. So please don't remind me the time frame. I will be taking five minutes more. I think that could be permitted to me because it is very vital for giving the right kind of the spirit to the, our scientists, to our forensic scientists. They should, what kind of the research they should conduct. Uh, So, uh, I think, uh, anyway, I have completed majority of the issues. Uh, let me recapitulate. So, what I am saying, the present way of forensic science and its status has to be transformed. It requires total transformation, not incremental changes. India is the best suited for any kind of the research and development irrespective of his field and more so for the forensic science. The kind of the complexity we are having, kind of the people, kind of the models of Randy, kind of the things that is no available, that is not there in any part of the world. And we have to create a full service. So I would like to again start from there is a need of revision of RRs. There is a need so that that specialist, when we are having that uh, MD and DMs, they are so many PhD, even Galgotha University is having the 40 PhD students. Right? And there are many. So there may be in total almost 1,000 students who are doing PhD in the uh, forensic science. 
it is a time that they should occupy an important place and whatever they have done that should be used for the betterment of the humanity for the investigation and detection of crime at the same time i would like to say that our forensic scientists they should not always look for employment they must jo hai uh, become the freelance experts and n number of services should be provided because if, if they have to purchase it there will be problem of the budget there will be problem of this and that the things would not be available so now a system has changed now we, we are in a era when there may be electricity line and electricity may be flowing of any company we are having railway track train may be run by anybody so the same thing there will be n number of the people n number of the service provider whether it is a providing the services of a vehicle whether it is the providing services for uh, uh, photography whether it's providing the services for packaging materials whether it is question of packaging first level second level and third level having the qr code based system where the who is giving what is the status at what point it is given we even we are in position to calculate that courier speed what which vehicle he might have used we can calculate those kind of the things also and there will be a certificate which will be giving a or which will be attaching the proof of chain of custody so that proof of chain of chain of custody would be available with the evidence whether it is demanded by defense lawyer and court of law or not it will be invariably be there sometime defense lawyer use their uh, that gimmick and uh, their the auditory power and uh, their their kind of the things where they create a reasonable doubt doubt in the mind of court sometime even court is influenced by the other consideration whatever be the reason the fact that there's a defeat of defeat of the justice so whether it is admissible or not that can be created a certificate giving all logic that why it is admissible and we can help the court to really decide about the admissibility and the arbitrary discretion of the court will also be taken away uh now the integration of the people in say or using that expertise in collection of the not only that uh, blood sample this that but minute traces exchange of the locardo principle exchange of the analysis everything should be integrated in the concept and the vision and it should be integrated in the services and specialized services need to be created and the payment will be made on the basis of the services they are providing so it is something like airtel theory airtel you have they 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 do not own the things they own the services and uh, all redundancy all obsolescence that sits on the person who provide the service uh, service provider or service who is providing the services so here also since developments technology and everything is really improving at a phenomenal pace why that should sit on the government so we can have only that what kind of the services are required and then we should have a revenue stream or, or payment stream and the system uh, so that what how that uh, payment will be made where the performance index or uh, 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 its grading should always be uh, placed uh, there so any payment so fees multiplied by its performance index or grading so the person who could not maintain their grading either their services will not be requisition or they will be paid less so it will be putting a very high degree of pressure on the service providers to maintain the very high standard of uh, services we have to really uh, uh, provide right to privacy raw data must not flow to uh, court, uh, to police and a time has come the crime free bharat it is saying about the five certainty certainty of registration of crime certainty of detection so system would be helping them to detect and forensic scientists would be playing a lead role in that and then it is saying certainty of conviction when certainty of conviction we are bringing element of respect to the uh, witnesses the requisitioning would be done uh, or uh, that uh, servicing of the summons and warrant would be done through our system so we would be doing unburdening and distressing of police police need not to be highly skilled because 
the skill and the talents of n number of the people who have they may be placed at the different places that will be available at the command of the iu and iu will not have unnecessary discretion because he has to go by the investigation lead and system would be generating investigation lead and raw data will not be even provided to the police if it is evidence it will be tagged with the certificates and it will be pushed to the court and in future we even intended to resolve 3.5 crore cases which are pending before the court by having out of box thinking and we dare to say in future there will be a court trial without wasting court my friends we have to work together to make it happen i am having a road map i am having a vision i call upon galgatia university and other university to really work with me and i am sure we will make it happen i wish all the best to my forensic students forensic experts and i call upon the faculty to please join this initiative jointly we will make it happen jai hind jai bharat and at the last i would like to once again thank uh, professor vini uh, her hod whole jo hai uh, staff of uh, including uh, uh, honor and uh, ceo mr galgotia vc uh, madam priti bajaj for having given me the opportunity to really talk on this uh, vital subject and i really call upon please don't do the way it is being done we are having a road map and i assure you crime free india crime free bharat is doable jai hind jai bharat thank you so much sir for guiding us uh, now i would like to request dr rajiv kumar to please present the virtual facilitation to our chief guest thank you puji sir kindly accept it thank you thank you accept it thanks a lot may i now request mr sunit kumar to please present the virtual facilitation to our guest of honor mr amar pal shokin sir hello hello yes sir yes sir you are audible yes sir good morning sir amar pal sir good morning sir i think he is not here sir he is here but his mic is muted okay if sir are listening then kindly accepted the guest of honor certificate from balgotia university thank you sir thank you sir may i again request dr rajiv kumar program chair department of forensic science balgotia university to deliver the vote of thanks okay thank you kushi it gives me immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks at this inaugural session of the forensics agora faculty development program on interdisciplinary research in forensics science organized by department of forensic science in collaboration with forensic india private limited gratitude is not only the greatest of virtue but the parent of all the others following these great words by sistro i express my sincere gratitude to our honorable chancellor sir mr sunil galgotia for providing us a platform to put our effort in to our action i would like to extend my gratitude toward our honorable ceo sir mr dhruv galgotia for his constant guidance and support my heartfelt thanks goes to our chief guest mr mathli saran gupta national president crime free bharat mission and former dgp madhya pradesh 
your words of wisdom and encouragement will surely boost up the confidence and morale of our young participant and we assure that we at department of forensic science school of basic and applied sciences golgotia university will participate and collaborate in the crime free bharat mission i am highly obliged to mr amarpal sokin assistant director chemistry forensic science laboratory delhi government for being with us here today as our guest of honor and sharing his vast experience and knowledge with our participants my heartfelt gratitude is for professor dr preeti bajaj honorable vice chancellor for guiding us on every step of the way of organizing the fdp my heartfelt thanks is for our pro vice chancellors professor dr venkatesh babu professor dr avdesh kumar and professor dr p k sharma for their constant support and motivation i convey my sincere thanks to mr nitin pande ceo and mr atul dubey managing director forensic india private limited for their kind support and generosity i also thank professor dr ak jain dean school of basic and applied science and convener of the fdp for his untimely support and guidance my heartfelt gratitude is towards all our invited speaker of our upcoming session for graciously accepting our invitation and taking time for us from their busy schedule thank you all dignitaries also a share a big round of applause for all our young student organizer for the amount of meticulous planning and coordination they have shown to make this event a successful one i also thank the team of very motivated motivated and dedicated fraternity members of the department of forensic science who knew their job and are result oriented i would also like to thank people who gave administrative and technical support and lastly i would like to thank all the participants of the event and wish them all the very best of luck for uh, upcoming session with these words i once again wish you all the very best thank you thank you so much rajiv sir Thanks. moving on i would now i would now like to introduce dr khushali joshi forensic expert lecturer representative ieif kursos brazil ma'am has done her doctorate in forensic science and currently she is the representative of ieif kursos brazil previously she was a lecturer at sardar patel medical institute ma'am has delivered multiple lectures in national and international conferences and has published many research papers in forensic biology ma'am will be sharing her knowledge on insights of nanotechnology and its approach to forensic science may i request kushali ma'am to please take over the charge of the session thank you so much kushali am i audible yes ma'am okay so uh, first of all i would like to thank tugal uh, gotias university and uh, forensic india for inviting me here and all the uh, legendary dignitaries and all the students who are present here so we'll start for our today's session so uh, is my screen visible uh, uh, can you all uh, see my screen yes ma'am it's now visible okay So yes, yes, ma'am, it's visible. Now. Okay, thank you. So yes, so our uh, today's session we are going to discuss about the uh, nanotechnology and its approach to the forensic sciences. So uh, nanotechnology is uh, basically a engineering subject, as we can see, and it is nowadays there is a huge, huge uh, approach where we can find out in the forensic sciences. So and let's have a talk on it. so before we start let's have an idea that what is nano like uh, the meaning of nano so nano is a prefix okay so in the greek the word nano means dwarf means extremely small uh, it is the name of the unit measures like 1 billion right so uh, if we say so it is 1 billion of a meter means 10 raised to minus 9 meter right so let's understand the size first 
see average of a small plant of a rose if we averagely see it can be up to one meter right a normal house fly which we are seeing in our house that can be one centimeter the eye of that uh, fly can be 100 micrometer and that hair small hair of that uh, fly that can be one micrometer and then our dna can be 10 micrometer right so 10 nanometer and one molecule among that dna that will be one nanometer right so a nanometer is a one billion of a meter that is 10 to minus 9 so this is roughly 10 times the size of an individual atom right any atom will be there so the tenth part of that atom that will be called as a nano so now let's have a uh, view on what is technology right till now we have seen what is nano now we'll see what is technology so the branch of the knowledge that deals with a certain field that will be a technology, right? For example, engineering is a technology. Industrial arts, that is a technology. Then applied sciences means our forensic science, what we are doing in the forensic, that will be also a technology. Pure sciences, what the people are doing, that can be also a technology. So when we are dealing our uh, with a very small uh, in, uh, very small atoms or very small molecules with uh, the use of technology that it is called nanotechnology so the engineering of a functional system at a molecular scale right a very small scale the manipulation of a structure of matter at a molecular level right so that can be called as a nanotechnology so basically, if we very simply, if we say, so it means a small technology, small part of small molecules, and at that level, if we are using technology, so that will be nanotechnology. And when we are using this nanotechnology to our forensic sciences for various means, so that will be forensic nanotechnology. Right. So first of all, Richard Feynman, 29th December in 1959 at the meeting of American Physical Society at California, first time he uh, present uh, the thought over the nanotechnology. So he is known as the father of nanotechnology and in his uh, presentation, first sentence what he spoke is there's plenty of room at the bottom. Right. So by that way, by that thought, the whole nanotechnology or how the research has been started. So what will be, what is the working concept of nanotechnology? How it got, works, right? So let's start with a very small uh, part for the atoms, right? So atoms are the building blocks of all the matters in the universe to all, right? So we all know that there are the 114 uh, atoms are there, means that the elements are there, and it is made up of all the atoms, right? Hydrogen, helium, lithium, oxygen, whatever it is. So, all are having atoms, and those atoms and molecules stick together because of they have the complementary shape, right? Like a lock and key, what we are having. A particular lock is having a particular key to open or close it. Right? Because why it is so? Because they both are having a complementary shapes. Right? That's why it is getting open or closed. In one particular lock, we cannot uh, open it with another key. Right? Because its shape is not that complementary. Right? Or the charges are uh, the same. Or sorry, the negative charges will be there. Right? Negative or positive. So the positively charged atoms will stick to the negatively charged atom, right? So those are uh, creating the attraction in between the atoms and the molecules. And like that, all the things are stick together. So every atom has exhibit of different property as a various conditions, right? All the atoms will work differently in their different conditions like heat, pH, um, environment, pressure. Right. So the goal of nanotechnology is to manipulate the atom individually 
and then uh, make a pattern to produce a desired structure. Right. So what here basically we are doing in the nanotechnology that if the atoms or if the molecules are having a specific kind of structure, so by manipulating them individually, all the atoms will uh, manipulate individually and we will create our desired structure. Whatever we want to make like that, we will create a different uh, structure that will be used according to our desire. So the most appropriate uh, properties of nanoparticles are size dependent. Here, what we are doing or what we are working, that will be the main concept will be the size. So the novel properties of nanoparticles do not prevail until the size has been reduced to the nanometer scale. Right. So first and foremost, if we want to work with the nanoparticles, we want to focus on size. Until and unless the molecular or the atoms will reach to nanometer size, it won't work according to our wish, or we, we can't manipulate according to what we want to decide. Right? The particle size plays a crucial role in nanoparticles' properties and therefore an essential task in property characterization of the nanoparticle is practical season. So here if we want to uh, apply nanotechnology or the nanoparticles according to our desire. So first and foremost, we have to modify the atoms and the molecules to the nanoparticle sizes, right? We have to reduce the size and then we can use according to our needful, needful things, right? So how we can modify it? What are the tools uh, that can, we can uh, modify our normal molecules to or the reduce the size towards the nanotools, right? Uh, nanomaterials. So there are various number of tools are, uh, available. So uh, mainly uh, we can say there will be uh, X-ray diffraction or the optical uh, spectroscope, scanning tunneling microscope, UV visible spectroscopy, uh, absorption and uh, photoluminous or the microscopy, Raman spectroscopy, so many uh, SAM is there, TAM is there. So all those uh, tools are there, which is worked, which can be worked with the nanotechnology or the nanoparticles. So uh, let's see one by one how it is working. So first of all, we'll discuss the X-ray diffraction. The spacing of atoms in a crystal uh, lattice can be determined by means of location and intensity of spots producing an photographic field beam of X-rays of given wavelength after the beam has been diffracted in the electrons of the atom. So light from a point source is focused on an object and light waves are scattered by the object then scattered uh, these will be recombined by the series of lens and generate an enlarged image of the object, right? How it is uh, really working, we'll see here. So if, for example, there is a, any molecule or any atom, so a large beam of light will be uh, spotted over the particular uh, atom. And because of that, the light will be scattered around. And that scattered light will be captured and then it will be uh, generated a, a molecular level image over here, like this, what we can see. So in a typical setup, a collimated beam of X-ray is inserted on the samples, like this here, what we can see. And the intensity of diffracted X-rays is measured as a function of diffracted angle, right? So when a particular angle, the light has been diffracted, here we can see, so the sharpness and the shape of the spot are related to the perfection of the crystal and the two basic procedure involve either a single crystal or a powder. And here, like that, we can see the uh, image, what we are getting. So uh, this is the tabletop X-ray diffraction from the here. See here, we have to put the samples. And after uh, placing the sample, uh, software is connected with this, and that will be a screen. And on screen, we can get the, this chart like this. Here we can see the different uh, points where the 
or the molecules uh, which are getting uh, shown or uh, will be seen here, like different uh, materials or different molecules can be seen here in the form of chart. Then the second uh, tool which is used in the nanotechnology that is optical spectroscopy. So the optical spectroscopy use the interaction of light with matter and function of wavelength or energy in order to obtain the information about the material. Right? For example, very uh, common example for this optical spectroscopy is UV visible spectroscopy, which is we are very widely using in forensic sciences or in the biology department. Uh, and um, chemical department or um, chemistry department, many it is very famous, right? and very widely used. So this technique involves absorption of near UV or visible lights, and one measures both the intensity and the wavelength. Right? We all know the we are Lambert's law, and based on that, this UV visible spectroscopy is working. And here, yes, this like this, we can see the. This is gold, okay. This is gold nanoparticle size or absorption wavelength we can see here. So the gold nano visible absorption directly related to the nanoparticle sizes, right? Whatever the particle size will be there, according to that, they will show the absorption here and they will show the chart over here. So addition to saturate the chloroauric or acid solution in the molecular ratio. So 0 0.17 to 1.4 acts to stabilize various nanoparticle sizes. Right? So the absorption band moves from 577 nanometer to 523 nanometer, suggesting that initial uh, cold nanoparticle size of 100 nanometer and a final uh, cold nanoparticle size up to 20 nanometer at the cyclic to the gold model ratio. And here, this, here we can see the charts. Yeah. So this is also UV visible analysis of uh, cold nanoparticle complexes, conjugation formation. So here we can see this red, it is showing the aurum that is cold nanoparticle. The gray line, this is showing the casein. Then the scan line, we're showing the lead. The agenda line is showing the phosphatidated chlorine. And like that, all the lines are showing, or uh, this here we can see the different uh, absorption uh, ratios right, for the gold nanoparticle conjugation with the other organic substances. Then, which is uh, useful in the nanotechnology and which is very commonly used, that is Raman spectroscopy. Right? So when the electromagnetic radiation passes through the metal, most of the radiation continues in its original direction, but a small fraction scattered into the other direction, right? So this is the basic principle how, how the Raman spectroscopy or the Raman scattering will work. So light that is scattered uh, due to vibrations in the molecule, so those uh, solids is called as a Raman scattering. And Raman spectroscopy is the measurement of the wavelength, intensity, and intellectuality scattered light from molecules, right? So the Raman scattered light occurs at the wavelength they are shipped from the incident light to the energies of the molecular vibrations. So such a scattering process is a weak. Experimentally, a lesser is needed for the good signal that we all know. Then comes the fluorescent spectroscopy. So at the room temperature, most of the molecules occupy the lowest vibration, right? So at that level of ground electron state and the absorption light of, uh, are elevated to produce an excited state. Right, that is uh, very common that at the room temperature, at the normal level, the, uh, all the molecules will be at the ground state. And if we want to uh, make them to excited state, we have to uh, give the outer or the uh, external source. That is That will be the absorption of the light. So having absorbed energy and reached one of the higher vibrations, levels uh, for an excited state, so molecular uses its access to the vibrational energy and by collision and falls of the lowest vibration level and from the excited state. So a plot of emission against a wavelength of any given excited wavelength is known as the emission spectrum. So that will be the principle of fluorescent spectroscopy. Then comes uh, the atomic force microscopy. 
Right. Uh, nowadays, uh, as the technology is getting advanced, so atomic force microscopy, SEM and TEM are mostly or very widely used for this nanotechnology use. So it enables us to study non-conducting surfaces because it scan Van der Waal force, which is its atomic tips. So here, previously, whatever the techniques we have discussed, so they are uh, mostly focusing on their principle are on the uh, molecular level or the exciting level or the electrons what they are having whatever the lights they are absorbing or the scattering but here atomic force microscopy will focus on the bonds uh, are having in between the two molecules and especially the van der Waal bonds so the main components of this tool are thin central level with the extremely sharp probing tip and the 3d piece of electron scanner and the optical system measured deflection of the centiliter. So when the tape is brought into contact with the surface or uh, in its proximity, taping the surface, it being affected by a combination of the surface that is attractive and repulsive. Right? We know that Van der Waals bonds have two types. One bonds will be attractive and the another will be repulsive. And like that, the whole molecule will be uh, can stay in a stable form. So those forces cause centilever bending, and uh, which is that which is continuously measured via the deflection and the reflection lasers. So the three D scanners move the sem uh, sample or in the alternative design, right? So the centiliver dimensions the scanning predetermined area of the surface and the vertical resolution of this tool is extremely high, reaching to 0.01 nanometer and which is for the order of atomic radius. So whatever the atomic radius will be there, at there, there will be either uh, attractive uh, force or the repulsive force and uh, those force uh, will be measured by the centiliver or a small laser and uh, that radius will be continuously captured and like that we can have an idea or we can have uh, the image of the atomic force microscopy right whatever the force see here the name itself we can identify whatever the force is generated by the attempts by and we are keeping the record of it with the help of microscope so that is called as atomic force microscopy right so here, this is the tip, this is the centiliver, the laser beam will pass from here, and this is the photo detector, whatever the laser is uh, passing through here, if it is getting like this, and here's the photo detector, and by that way, we are getting the pictures through the software, right? So yeah, uh, this is the picture, how we can see the surface, See here, it is a very small size yeah, tube or on, and this is the uh, chemical probe. And here we can see things generate the picture. Then let's talk about the transmission electron microscopy, which is called TEM. So TEM is a high voltage electron emitted by a cathode that is focused on by a lens. So the sample is first placed under the vacuum, right? And after that, a high voltage electron beam is partially transmitted through the uh, molecule and then the transmitted electrons are subsequently focused and uh, then the beam hits the photosport screen and the photographic plate or the sensitive uh, or the sensors will create an image, right? So the TEM only provides two-dimensional image for the sample, right? For the uh, like uh, diffraction patterns or regarding the inner surface of the material. See, like this. So here, what happens when a, a forced electron is coming here, right? So it is creating uh, the sensors over uh, here over, and then it is catching the picture. Right here, like that. This is the uh, how the tank person look like, right? And here we can see the two D that is inner structure images. Now comes the sem. 
that is scanning electron microscope. So the cell is very different from the TEM, right? In the ways of final images. Why? Because uh, what TEM is doing, TEM is uh, creating the 2D image, right? 2D image means if we want to see the inner structure, that uh, what is uh, you know, a very small kind of structure we have to study. So at that time, we should use TEM. But when we need the 3D structure, we want to study the morphology or the surface of any particular substance. At that time, we should use the cell. Because while TEM detects the primary electrons, same generates the image by secondary or backscattered electrons, which is emitted from the material due to excited by the primary electron beams. So in SEM, the electron beam is scanning across the sample and building an image and mapping detecting signals, signals yeah, as a function or a beam position. So the generally resolution limit of SEM is about 5 nanometer. Right. So as we say that it is creating the 3D structure. So when we are focusing more on surface morphology, so at that time, the SEM will be very much helpful. Now, this is the SEM. And here we can see the surface morphology. See, so sharply, so beautifully, it is generating the very clean pictures. Of, uh, this is the white blood cells, okay, which is present in blood. So this is the uh, pictures of white blood cells. Right. So these all are the tools what we are talked about till now. So by using the such kind of tools, we can uh, get the, our desired uh, size of a particle or size of the nanoparticles, or we can identify uh, uh, that nanoparticles are present over any surface or any molecules or not. So what we discussed that we, first of all, we have to focus on the size. And after we are getting our uh, desired size of particle, then we have to make a structure of it, right? So now let's focus on the structure. First of all, we got the size. Okay, nanoparticle size, we reached up to nanometers. Then the nanocomposites, we have to composite all the molecules, all the nanoparticles together to make uh, some structure. So those are uh, the polymers, are copolymers having nanoparticles or the nanofilers disappeared in the polymer matrix, right? So those shapes can be nanospheres or nanocrystals, nanotubes or quantum dots, right? So what are all these things? Let's see one by one. So first of all, uh, it is, let's talk about the carbon nanotubes, right? So carbon nanotubes, so carbon nanotubes are allotropes of carbon with a cylindrical nanostructure, right? When we are making a cylindrical structure with the nanoparticles, so that will call as a nanotube. So they have length to diameter ratio up to 30 lakh and 20,000 gem one. Like it is very huge number, right? So nanotubes are the member of fluorocentrine structural family, right? Fullerens, fullerens structural family. They derive from their long hollow structure with the walls formed one thick sheet of carbon called the graphene. It's not a graphite, it's a graphene, right? So what are the properties of carbon tubes? So they are highest strength of weight ratio helps in creating lightweight uh, spacecrafts. To whatever the things uh, we are using in the spacecraft. So at that time, what the scientists are keeping in the mind that it should be very strong. It's, as well as uh, simultaneously, it should be very light in the weight, right? So that time, this carbon nanotubes will be very much helpful because it is made with the nanoparticles. So uh, the weight and size will be reduced, but its uh, strength will be very high. It easily penetrates the membranes such as cell walls. So it is helping the cancer treatments, right? So electrical resistance 
changes significantly when the other molecules themselves to carbon atoms. So helps in the developing sensors and detecting the chemical weapons. So how it uh, all this works, so we will see it later in our slides that how it is working in the cancer treatment, how it is working with the chemical vapors, finding the chemical vapors, right? First, now we are focusing on just on the shape of the different uh, nanomaterials. So what are the application of the nanotube? So as we said, it is stem bell spots uh, using the CNT, making bicycle component, uh, components. Right, this is the company, which is called Aston Bell Sports. They are making the bicycle up from them. Then Cerex technology using the CND for manufacturing lightweight boats. Right. Then replacing the transistors from the silicon chips as they are small and emit less heat. Right. So whatever the silicon chips they are having in the transistor or in the pen drives or in any electronic materials what we are using. So nowadays they are that can be replaced by the nanotubes because they are very smaller in size and they are not emitting as much as heat what silica chips will do. They are all, uh, especially work in the electric cables and wires, solar cells, and in many fabrics also. Then another uh, shape of uh, nanoparticle that is nanorods. Right? First, uh, previously we saw that is nanotube. Now let's see the nano rows. So they are one morphology of a nanoscale object. So its dimension ranges from one to hundred nanometer. So they may be synthesized from the metal or semiconducting materials. Right. So a combination of lichens act as a shape control agents and bond to different facets of the nano road with a different strength and it allows different phases of the nano road to grow at different rate that we, uh, for producing an elongated object, right? So what are the uses of it? So in display technology, because the reflectivity of the roads can be changed by the changing their orientation with an applied electronic fields. So it is highly used in uh, LED and LCD uh, screens, what we are seeing in our laptops or in our uh, TV or whatever the screen we are seeing nowadays. So that uh, area, the nano rods will be used. In micro electron, uh, micro mechanical systems, right? And in the cancer therapeutics. Then a uh, very uh, beautiful and very interesting structure for uh, this uh, nanoparticles will be nanoports. So it is made up of uh, two words, that is nano robots. So that are nano robots, right? So what is that? So it is close to the cell of 10 to to minus nine, almost one nanometer size. So largely uh, they are in R&D phase. They are not widely used. So they are in, still in the research and development phase, but it is uh, being uh, said that it is going to change the many, many, many technologies in the coming years. So nanoports of 1.5 nanometers across, and they are capable of counting the specific molecules into chemical samples. Right. Since the, the nanoports uh, would be microscopic in size, it would be probably necessary for a very large number of them to work together to microscopic and microscopic tasks. So they are capable of replication using environmental resources. So what will be the application of that? So detection of toxic components in the environment, right? in the drug delivery, in the biomedical instrumentations, this kind of nanoports will going to help. So how in the drug delivery, for example, as we previously also uh, said, uh, that it will be helpful in the cancer uh, detection or the cancer drug delivery. So how it will work? Then, uh, for example, if a person is having cancer in any particular area of their body, for example, in their lungs, right? So uh, the chemical therapeutics, what we are getting now, what we say, uh, chemo doses. So chemo doses, what we will do, they will insert the uh, medicine in their vein, right? So that uh, uh, medicine is going towards 
uh, like all the uh, cells in the body, right? It will enter in the blood and through blood, it will go all through the body. So uh, because of its side effects, we know that if a cancer patient is going under through chemotherapy, so he loses his hair, uh, he's having uh, digestion problems, he's having um, other, so many, lot of many issues, skin issues like that. Why? Why it is so? Because of the side effects of the chemotherapy. But if uh, in future, if we are using these nanobots or nanotechnologies, so in drug delivery, where, for example, if the cancer cells are present in the lungs, so this nanobots directly goes to that specific area and then deliver the drug. And uh, because of that, the whole body structure or all the cells of the body is not getting affected. Okay? So this is the uh, under the research and development phase. So yeah, what we talked about, nanotechnology in the cancer. So it provides a new option for drug delivery and the drug therapies enable drugs to deliver to precisely at the right location in the body and releases drug dose on the predetermined schedule for the optional treatment, right? Attach the drug with a nano-sized carrier, carrier, and they become localized at the disease site, that is cancer tumor. So the drugs will go to the cancer tumors only, and it is killed only tumor cells and not the healthy or the nearby cells. And then a port can clear the blockage in the arteries also, what are uh, having uh, this uh, So like that, it will work. The other uses for the nanotechnology that is also in fabrics. So the properties of familiar materials are being changed by the manufacturer who are adding nano-sized components to the conventional materials to improve the performance, right? To make uh, the fabric more smoother, uh, more finer. And uh, the another use for the nanotechnology is in, uh, uh, for uh, this uh, heat or heat resistance or the cold resistance like that. The, in fabrics also nanotechnology has been used. So some clothing manufacturers are making water and stain repellent clothing using the nano-sized uh, whiskers in the fabric that cause the water to bead up on the surface. Right? In the manufacturing of bulletproof jackets and uh, spill and dirt resistant antimicrobial antibacterial fabrics. So in that technology also nanoparticles are having a very huge role. Right? In the electronics. So the electrodes made from the nanowires enable flat, flat panel display to be flexible as well as the thinner than the current flat panel displays, right? So nowadays what you are seeing in the curved TV or a curved display or a curved phone, so that is all because possible with the help of nanotechnology. So nanolithography is a use for the fabrication of chips. The transition, the transistors are made of the nanowires and they are assembled in a glass or a thin film or a flexible plastic, right? Here, uh, what we can see, very small, very flexible, and yet very resistant um, chips or the nanowires or the glass films we can produce. Then e-paper displays on the sunglasses and map on the car machine. So that all things can be possible through it. So yes, still now whatever we discuss, that is about the nanotechnology and its application in the different field, right? But what is the application in the forensic sciences, right? So there are a huge number of application of foreign, in the forensic sciences of nanotechnology and the nanoparticles. For example, in explosives, toxicology, pathology, serology, question documents, fingerprinting, uh, forensic engineering. So lots and lots more there. Okay, so let's go uh, one by one and discuss. So, let's end. So at present, in the quantification of post-PCR, that is polymer gene reaction, is the utmost extensive forensic nanotechnology application in the microfluidic system. Right. So nowadays, what you are uh, in the market, what we are having, the automated uh, PCR machines or uh, automated uh, extraction uh, 
factors are available. So in those things, uh, the forens, uh, this nanoparticles will be having a high weight. So in a very short period of time, there is within hardly 30 minutes, the DNA samples can be quantified even in the nanoliter range. Right? If we are not having samples, of course, in the forensic sciences, it has always been said for the forensic biologists that they are always uh, are in the uh, run for the samples. They are don't have any samples, right? So if they are having even a nanoliter sample, it means a very small amount of sample. So by the use of forensic nanotechnology and the nanoparticles, the quantified uh, quantification DNA samples extra extraction can be possible. So the magnetic nanoparticles, for example, silica based magnetic nanoparticles and copper nanoparticles for the extraction of good quality of PCR ready DNA samples from a different forensically significant body fluids and the skeletal remain samples, right? So it will be used most importantly in the skeletal remains or the body fluids. At that time, what they are doing is they will use the nanoparticles of silica and nanoparticles of the copper, and by that they will uh, extract the DNA sample and perform the PCR. So the DNA extracted from the urine, they are using organic reagents, while uh, carboxylated magnetic nanoparticles uh, used with the solid phase and absorbent to the isoelectronic DNA for the PCR amplification. Then comes the forensic toxicology. So in the current scenario, nanotechnology most effectively applied in the field of forensic toxicology for the detection and quantification of different toxic substances from various uh, forensically important evidences like blood, saliva, hair, vitreous humor, even from the skeletal remains or fingerprint samples. Right. So if any a small amount of uh, toxicological evidence will be uh, present in this kind of evidences. There can be chances that by use of nanotechnology or the nanoparticles, we can uh, extract from it. Right. So for the identification purpose, gold nanoparticles uh, ranging from 10 nanometer to 30 nanometer and the silver nanoparticles uh, ranging from the 20 nanometer and titanium oxide nanoparticles have been used and claim that these nanoparticles enhance the detection limit of the illicit drug in the fingerprint samples. Okay? For example, if a person is um, having or has uh, taken any illicit drugs and uh, for the, that drug is mixed with his blood and then it is you know, going uh, uh, with the perspiration or, or something, and that person is uh, uh, having that the fingerprints, like the latent fingerprints somewhere. So it may be possible that if by the use of all these nanoparticles, we can may identify the illicit drug molecules with his latent fingerprints. Then forensic explosives. Forensic uh, so efficient detection of hidden explosives in luggage or mail, vehicles or aircrafts or uh, toothpaste or any public places or wherever it is, that is the major challenge for the law and enforcement agencies throughout the world. Right? And nowadays, um, very uh, uh, improvised explosive devices can be fitted in any part, like a very toothpaste. Uh, in pen or whatever, any public places. So it is very difficult to identify. So currently, trace-based explosive detection system in use, which have limitations in very selective uh, sensitivity. Right? Size, uh, then its cost. So uh, miniaturization of system to bench top or even the handheld level has immense potential, especially for the trace explosive detection. Right? So at that time when we have to uh, uh, go for the trace explosive detection, it is very difficult to perform the uh, activities or to identify those things on the ground. 
So hence, the highly sensitivity and selectivity combined with the ability lower the production and deployment cost of the sensor is indispensable in the winning the battle on the explosive based terrorism. So what we need is very um, highly sensitive, with that very cost effective and a small uh, handheld uh, device we need to identify the um, explosive or the post blast uh, investigation. So in the modern research and development studies in this area of uh, field, the nanomaterials have demonstrated the ability of nanostructure and function as a sensor of various chemical and biological components, including explosives. How? Let's see. So the scientist has developed the e-nose, that is electronic nose, right? So nose, what the nose we are having, that only, but that will be electric nose. So how it will work? Let's see. So e-nose is basically a sensor device. So in any sensor, the surface chemical processes are transformed as a signal. For example, in front of this device, if you are uh, keeping any kind of the chemicals, so they will, uh, you know, uh, previously there has uh, the data in that, and by that, uh, uh, their sensors, that chemical will get the identified. So in case of e nose, the signals are nothing but the unique order particular of a specific chemical reaction. Right? So electronic nose consists of an order sensor or a data preprocessor and the pattern recognition engine. So e nose as the manifestation of the electronic aroma detection technology. Right. This technology will identify the aroma. So what is aroma? So aroma will be a specific chemical reactions and those uh, chemical reaction will be catched by a sensor and that sensor is having a preprocessor or a pre -filled, uh, filled data and that will match. Right. So how it is done? Uh, previously, uh, right now also it is going on. So at present, the dogs have been trained and uh, used for successfully uh, to identify the hidden explosives. However, the dogs are costly to train and it is not possible to take drug, uh, dogs all the time on the crime scene or sometimes the dogs are not able to identify the dogs is uh, getting confused, right? So at that time, or uh, it can be a uh, replace, uh, replaceable technology with the dogs, sniffer dogs. So the electronic nose technique can mimic the bomb sniffing dogs without their drawbacks, right? And the dogs, because dogs are also uh, uh, an animal, right? They are also a natural animal. So all the time it is not possible to give exact um, detection in the every situation, right? So this, at that time, this technique can be use this technology will be very helpful. So overall, nanotechnology-based sensor have strong potential and meeting all the requirements of uh, an effective solution for the detection of explosives. Right? Then comes the forensic fingerprint visualization. So we all know that on the crime scene, mostly three types of fingerprints are found. That is either a latent fingerprints, or a patent or a plastic fingerprints. So almost every crime scene carries latent fingerprints, which are not easily visible with the naked eye and need for the further processing. So to decipher the latent finger marks, a range of physical and chemical method has been developed. So the various common materials are there to the background and making identification considerably through the achievement. So, so what to do? So to overcome such problems and for more preciseness, nanotechnology is being used to develop the fingerprints. To decipher the fingerprint pattern, nanoscale powder has been used. So the various studies have been reported in which the nanopowders has uh, deciphered the fingerprint in recently one of them is reported the oxide powder. Right. So within the 20 nanometer of size, they give the better prints. 
So using a nanoscale developer and an X-ray source technique together. So a development um, is can be there that to visualize the imprinted fingerprints, even if the casing has been rubbed or washed, right? So based on this fact, when someone leaves those finger impression on the bullet casing, right? If someone is having fingerprints on bullet casing, he's throwing that uh, bullet case or he's rubbing his uh, fingerprints or he's even washing with the water, right? So still, there can be a chance that with the help of nanoparticles uh, and the uh, uh, X-ray source technique, we can uh, develop these fingerprints again on the casing. Right? So the residue through a hydrophobic interaction, which can be then developed with the silver physical developer, and then which is producing the impression of rich detail that not only they improve the quality, but develop the print, but also the clarity of the print. Similarly, developed another method of fingerprint enhancer using the cadmium selenide and the zinc sulfide nanoparticles. So in that suspension or non-porous surfaces, so cadmium uh, and uh, cadmium uh, selenide and the zinc sulfide nanoparticles are the potential to give fluorescence under the UV lighting. Then even uh, these nanoparticles having a great uh, you know, role in uh, identifying for the frauds or the question documents in the forensic sciences. So uh, most importantly, the passport frauds is the biggest threat facing the world. So it is claimed by the Interpol published, uh, which is date 29 January 2019. So the greatest threat in the world is the last year there were 500 million hours or the, we can say the half billion international air arrivals worldwide where travel documents were not compared against the Interpol database. So this is the very huge number. So the what happens or what are the trends with the documents and uh, the other products which is uh, been, uh, getting questioned. So the sophistication of the counterfeiters are increasing, right? Advanced printings are there. Uh, advanced manufacturing procedures are there. They are having a uh, you know, uh, very uh, advanced level of softwares. So counterfeiting a high value or a high volume business nowadays. From the start, you know, range from the various means like from the currency or any ID cards, um, even with the medicine, spare parts, softwares, whatever it is. So whatever uh, the things you can see around uh, ourselves, our environment, so there is a high chance that the counterfeiting the same product can be possible. So fraud and the counterfeiting is an organized crime, right? So the, it funds the large operations, including the child rapers, terrorist activities, or uh, many, many other things uh, can be involved in such things. So this need the uh, multiple layers like overt, covert, forensics, and many other fields. Right. So, technology helps in the determining the authenticity of items. Right. Then, technology can also apply in the various sectors to prevent them from forged or the duplicate products. How? So, the nanotechnology is also relevant in those cases in which the petroleum products are involved such as arson cases, examine the petroleum or hydrocarbon traces, and uh, it will be helpful uh, by generating the barcode stickers, like in those barcodes, the nanoparticles will be used in the printing, in the printing ink, and by that, this uh, uh, scanner or the barcode stickers, or by that, it can be uh, preventing for the uh, forged product or the forged documents, right? Then again, yes, nanotechnology even can be very, very useful in the forensic medicine field too. So uh, whatever important uh, when a person or a cadaver is found or in a crime scene or if there is a dead body is found. So the first question comes in your mind is the time since death. So how much time has been passed after this person is dead? 
right? So what are the parameters uh, to identify? So first of all is algor mortis, right? Algor mortis means the uh, changes in the temperature, then changes in the ice, then post-mortem hypothesis, right? Then rigor mortis, then changes in the decomposition, changes in the skin color, liver mortis, then stomach or polar content, then contains in the uh, urinary bladder, right? There's so many, so many parameters are there. And by you know, combining all the parameters together, a uh, forensic pathologist is coming to an uh, uh, verdict or uh, get a conclusion that uh, a range between this to this time, the person, the time since death can be possible, right? So all this parameter can only provide the approximate time of the death, right? So at that time, the observational changes in the body fluids like blood or um, pericardial fluid or spinal fluid or aqueous humor, vitreous humor, right? And so all this, uh, uh, these fluids will be helpful. So out of these body fluids, the vitreous humor remains unchanged. So what is uh, vitreous humor first? We all know that in our eyes when the person has died, the fluid which is present in the eye because of the uh, death of the uh, eye cells or the eyeball, eyeball cells, so that's called the vitreous humor. So that exhibit the biochemical, uh, that is the level of amino acids which is present in there, it is very slow. And therefore, by the help of this biochemical analysis, time since death can be estimated very acutely, right? The whatever the amino acid present in our eye cells, that will take a uh, like long time or it will uh, get uh, very slowly. So by the identification of there are the quantification of estimated time. So recently, a smart, a rapid and a sensitive, very cost effective uh, procedure uh, technique has been developed that provides easy determination of a cysteine amino acid method. So this method may lead to estimate the time since death up to 96 hours till the cysteine concentration from the vitreous human increases significantly and showing a linear core uh, relation with the expansion of time since death. Right, so this all are the application of uh, nanotechnology in forensic sciences. And besides that, there are much more, many applications are there and we can uh, use it. We can uh, have a good command over that and we can uh, do a good research. So there will be many, many more chances to develop it, right? So in our Indian government also, they are having a, a very huge, uh, and many research projects are there. So uh, IIT Mumbai is the premier organization in the field of nanotechnology. So research in the field of health, environment, and medicines are uh, still going on. And starting with the 2001, the government of India launched a nanotechnology initiative. Right? Then in 2017, the nanoscience and the technology mission 2007 is initiated with an allocation of rupees 1,000 crores for the deep uh, years. So while the government is uh, trying to enhance or to encourage this field, so the basic it is called basic research promotions, infrastructure development for carrying out the front ranking regions and development of nanotechnology in their applications and human resource development and the international collaborations, right? So there are many possibilities in the future that the nanotechnology may make it possible for the manufacture of higher and stronger and programmable materials that requires the less energy to produce than the conventional materials. And then uh, that promise a you know, greater fuel efficiency in the land transportation, ships, aircrafts, or uh, even in the space vehicles, right? So the future of nanotechnology could very well include in the use of nanorobotics 
and these nanopods uh, have the potential to take on human tasks as well as the tasks that humans could never complete. So the rebuilding of the depletion ozone layer could potentially be able to perform in the future. So let's make a finger crossed for that. So at the end, the bottom line, I could only say that the next big thing is going to be really small. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. And all of you have a great day ahead. And again, thank you all uh, people and thank you, Gokotia's University, for allowing me to come here and deliver a lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this informative session. Uh, may I please, please request Neha Yadav to present the virtual salutation to Dr. Krishali Joshi. Thank you so much, ma'am, for graciously accepting our invitation and sharing your deep knowledge about nanotechnology and its various application in forensic science, even despite of different time zones. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to ask you, ma'am, to kindly accept our gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. And ma'am, we would love to have you in person at our university once the condition normalizes. Sure, I, it will be my pleasure to uh, meet you all and be there. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, moving forward, now I would like to introduce Dr. Ashish Bhadia. Sir is the head of department, Department of Forensic Science, Government Institute of Forensic Science, Nagpur. Sir has completed his BSc honors in Forensic Science in 2009, MSc Forensic Science in 2011, and PhD in Forensic Science. So is UGC NET JRF qualified? He has 40 international and national research paper publications to his credit. Sir has also recently won the Young Scientist Award at a national conference jointly co-organized by the State Forensic Science Laboratory, Madhya Pradesh, and Indian Science Congress Association, Sagar, Chapter in BT Institute of Excellence, Sagar, Madhya Pradesh. Since 2012, he has delivered more than 100 invited talks, guest lectures, workshops, demonstrations at various colleges, institutes, and universities, as well as to the police officers under the Nagpur Police Commissionerate, Special IGP Office Nagpur Range, SP Office Bandra, SP Office Chandrapur, under in service training program, etc. And also, sir has played the prime role in organizing and conducting Nagpur City Police duly meet 2017, 2018, 2019 as subject expert and examiner. Sir has also provided assistance to the Maharashtra Police in the various aspects of crime scene investigation. Sir will be giving his outlook on the topic and introduction to cybercrime. May I request, sir, to please start with his presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, I would like to thank Gilgutia's University for inviting me to have this talk but uh, uh, as told by the host I will not be presenting my uh, you know presentation on uh, the topic introduction to cyber crime uh, there was some uh, miscommunication from my end actually uh, I was invited to talk on the interdisciplinary research in forensic science on this topic by uh, Vinnie Madam. So with the permission of Vinnie Ma'am, I would like to stick to this topic if it is fine. Uh, forensic science. Now, what do you understand by the term forensic science? When I say forensic science, most of us will first think of ID, like not all of us, but who are new to this field, they would first think of CID, right? So they'll say, okay, yes, forensic science means the people who goes to the crime scene and uh, collect the evidence and uh, the one person who is involved in uh, everything, right? But actually that is not the case. In real life, one person is not only uh, involved in, you know, analyzing all the evidences and giving all the reports, being the expert in the court and performing autopsy, collecting all the evidences from the crime scene, et cetera, et cetera. So all these roles and responsibilities are divided and shared amongst different people with different levels of expertise. All right. 
so the serials and the movies that we see they are uh, for our entertainment purposes only so we should treat them as such and uh, although nowadays there are serials and series and movies that are also based on some scientific inputs from experts but most of it is um, you know uh, non scientific so we should not completely rely on uh, whatever we see on uh, you know um, online okay so let us start by having a look at the definition of the term forensic science see our topic today is interdisciplinary research in forensic science okay so uh, when i tell this definition this is very important because it encompasses all the various fields and multiple disciplines of science in it okay so uh, after you know almost um, being in the um, forensic science for for almost uh, 14 uh, 15 years uh, i have come across uh, various definitions of forensic science but the one definition that i am going to um, you know tell you right now is the one that is uh, that i found to be most comprehensive now forensic science can be defined as the application of various scientific methods and techniques for the purposes of justice now you may feel that this is a very simple definition but no it it is a combination of uh, you know complex uh, terms like i have underlined here scientific methods and techniques for the purposes of justice now uh, can anyone tell me very quickly the difference between a method and a scientific method if if someone is allowed to unmute themselves uh, if they have an answer very quickly the difference between a method and a scientific method see the point is a method when you use will not give you repeatable results your accuracy will not remain the same the accuracy of the results will not remain the same there would be uncertainty the probability of you recreating that particular thing again would be less if you don't have all the parameters if you don't know all the parameters right similarly in forensic science also we cannot use any method we cannot use any technique and also we don't use one single method and we don't use one single technique we use a combination of different methods and techniques that are scientific like i'd like to quote a simple example here uh, i think all of you would have prepared tea most of you would be drinking tea right now imagine that whenever you make tea do uh, does it taste good yes of course you make it so you would say that yes it is good but tell me whether it is the same taste every time that you prepare the tea or coffee or even is it same no i don't think so why is it not same because we are using method to make that particular drink or Uh, that recipe, right? Now, when we say scientific method, now uh, tea from this tea vending machine or coffee from coffee vending machine, even if you drink ten times, the taste would be exactly identical. Why is it the case? Because the powder is fixed, the quantity is fixed, the temperature to which the water is going to get heated is fixed. right the sequence of the ingredients that are falling into a cup that is also fixed right so this is the basic difference between a method and a scientific method scientific methods when we use them they have repeatability they have accuracy and we can avoid uncertainty all right now for what we are using these scientific methods and techniques for normal purposes no for the purposes of justice this is to whom this is to the society or to the victim or to the family members of the victim against whom the crime has taken place so for this when we apply various scientific methods and techniques 
that may be termed as forensic science. Uh, this is a very comprehensive definition. This uh, definition was taught to me by my professor, Dr. P. K. Chattopadhyay, while uh, I was studying in uh, my graduation and post-graduation. Now, uh, see, science is always defined as like a tree that has many branches, correct? Physics, chemistry, biology, geology, zoology, botany, earth science, space science, life science, etc., etc., correct? But I would also like to define forensic science as a tree that has many branches like fingerprints, question documents, forensic chemistry, forensic toxicology, forensic biology, forensic anthropology, forensic odontology, forensic serology, forensic physics, forensic ballistics, forensic psychology, forensic photography, digital and cyber forensics, forensic engineering, forensic nanotechnology, forensic biotechnology, forensic geology, forensic entomology, etc, etc, etc. Don't you think these are all the branches, different branches of forensic science? Yes. So now forensic science is an amalgamation of all these branches, all these different branches. And there are different principles and different methods and techniques that are being used from all these disciplines. We use certain instruments and equipments and principles from the field of physics, from the field of chemistry, from the field of toxicology, from the field of anthropology, from the field of medicine, right? So this proves that forensic science is a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary field or subject. Correct. It is an amalgamation of various scientific methods and techniques from different branches of science. Agreed? Now, what are the cases that we investigate? Some of the cases that we investigate include murder, decoity, theft, robbery, suicide or attempted suicide, physical assault, bomb blast, fire or arson cases, accidents, hit and run cases, forgery cases, shooting, wildlife crimes, kidnapping, abduction, cyber crimes, white collar crimes, drowning, bright burning, sexual assault, hanging, illicit drugs, poisoning, etc. These are some of the crimes that we as forensic expert would encounter at one stage or other in our career. Now, I have already told you the different divisions or branches of forensic science in the image that we saw. Now, at the scene of a crime, when we do documentation of the crime scene, there are different methods that are being used by us. Yes, photography is one such method, forensic photography. So again, in that we are using the principles of photography to click forensic photographs of the scene of crime for documentation of the same. While sketching, we are measuring things we are taking different measurements and nowadays we are using automated softwares or computer aided design softwares, CAD softwares for making the sketch of the crime scene. Similarly, for doing autopsy, nowadays we are moving on towards virtual autopsy, wherein we will have to, uh, you know, we will minimize the contact with the uh, cadaver and uh, we will be able to perform uh, uh, the autopsy examination or the postmortem examination with minimal uh, invasion or minimal cuts to the body. Forensic nanotechnology, Madam earlier has uh, given you a very good uh, you know, talk on this topic. So I'll not go into the details of it. So these are the different branches. Okay, these are the different uh, divisions of forensic science. Uh, which we will encounter. So uh, when we talk about interdisciplinary research or multidisciplinary research, we have to keep certain things in mind. We first have to open our imagination. We don't have to, we have to remove that barrier of imagination. We, we should feel free to imagine things. We should, you know, feel free to 
conceived new ideas and different ideas that are unheard or unsaid till now but at times it also happens that we may think of something and we may think that yes this is a very novel idea this is a very new work but we fail to understand that there are millions and millions of people on this planet earth right right so they all uh, they are also thinking so uh, it is possible that what you think of as a novel idea may already have been published somewhere else by some else so for any research see again the word research itself is research so for that you have to move from known to unknown like research is said to be a journey from known to unknown right so uh, you have to first find out whatever is known first you need to identify that whether uh, what was the kind of work that was carried out in this particular field or this particular area right then after that you need to identify the gaps in the research when you identify these gaps in the research then you can conceive a idea that is new that is novel and you will fulfill that gap and this way your research will mean something in the field see doing research is uh, you know thought of as a easy task ki are koi bhi anyone can do research anyone can you know uh, publish uh, papers and anyone can do research but that is actually not the case research is a very complex process it involves many different um, you know things that uh, we fail to understand in the beginning and then as we move ahead we come across these uh, things as problems in our research or setbacks in our research so we must avoid that okay uh, these are the evidences uh, that may be found so you all know all these evidences so i'll not go into the details of it now talking about multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary research there are certain points that you need to understand and you need to keep in your mind while uh, you know encompassing an idea for research first of all you need to decide what field do you want to pursue your research in see uh, it is not it does not mean that you should limit yourself to one field only there are different disciplines you can have an amalgamation you can have a, a bridging you can bridge the gap between those two fields those two subjects those two topics but that is fine but first you need to let your imagination flow freely first you need to initiate take initiation first you need to take initiation of an idea first you need to think of an idea and work on it start working on it what do you mean by working on it when a, when we start working on an idea the first thing as i told you is doing research on what is already being done what what research has already been carried out on that particular topic or in that particular area this we need to understand first right and talking about inspiration see inspiration can be drawn out of anything uh, to be uh, uh, very frank to you uh, i have drawn um, you know quite a few inspiration for my uh, papers for my research papers from movies that i have seen not uh, bollywood movies of course hollywood movies but i have drawn inspiration from those movies so when 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 you see things when you you know come across any uh, interesting thing you should note it down and you should you know try to imagine you should try to think uh, what can be done by me in this particular area or in this particular topic right now innovation is the keyword nowadays everybody um, you know wants to innovate and uh, government also wants to innovate we are asking for innovative ideas innovative uh, um, designs innovative logos etc so innovation again is a process that cannot be taught it comes naturally to people it comes naturally to us if if we are able to you know um, um, draw inspiration from uh, our uh, surroundings 
we will be able to innovate now once we innovate or once we imagine an idea once we have drawn inspiration and we have initiated our research in that particular field then we will come across different researches or papers that are already published in that field we need to identify the gaps in those and fulfill those gaps work on fulfilling those gaps see uh, when we when i read research papers nowadays so i see that uh, the that is just a, a you know combination of uh, a text from different published works so a review, a review paper is actually very difficult to write a review paper is actually very difficult to write see you don't know where to start you don't know where to end you don't know what um, you know what to say so all these uh, things things bring us uncertainty to uh, our uh, research right so uh, first we should you know try to reduce the amount of uncertainty that we have in our topic or in the area that we have uh, we are thinking of uh, uh, doing our research in all right now review papers uh, as i see uh, nowadays uh, they are just like i have told you earlier also they are just a collection of uh, uh, you know different um, um, uh, uh, paragraphs from different works or different researchers they club it together and that is called a, a review paper actually that is not the case uh, writing a review paper is uh, very very difficult and it's a, it's a complex process once again so uh, first we need to understand what we are researching then we need to identify the keywords that we are going to use for searching or researching the various published papers in the field then we need to shortlist or narrow down from the vast variety of uh, you know research papers or review papers or articles that uh, we find in the uh, search engines then we should narrow down uh, our search further by removing the you know unwanted papers and focusing on only the most relevant articles that are related or directly relevant to the current topic of your research then we should read all those papers very carefully we should try to understand the methodology that was used by the researchers and uh, those particular papers or those particular articles then we should understand we should try to understand why they carried out this work what was the rationale behind the work that they carried out and then what was the method or the process that uh, was used by these researchers now why is it important to understand what methods were used by them because if they have given negative results if they have shown that certain method is not going to work then you it is beneficial for us we come to know that we should not you know uh, invest our time and energy in uh, you know uh, doing this method or using this method to get result because it is not going to work right so again this is also an important aspect of uh, reviewing now uh, negative results also nowadays are you know getting importance uh, the much deserved importance earlier what used to happen was that negative results uh, were thought of a failure of research suppose if you are um, you know trying to um, uh, do research in a particular topic if you are trying to develop a, a method or if you are trying trying to develop a technique or suppose if you are trying to uh, so say carry out tlc thin layer chromatography examination of a particular drug all right now if you are using a solvent system suppose uh, 50% methanol and 50% distilled water one is to one ratio methanol and water and you don't get result of that particular compound you are not getting separation you are not getting good results of tlc so this would be another failure of research earlier by most but nowadays it is not the case nowadays there are journals they have specific section specifically publish only negative results only negative findings that no this method does not work it will not give result here so even if you get negative result you should you know not be disheartened you should uh, you not get uh, 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 you know you should not panic that oh my result is not coming what should i do you should stick to it you should stick to your idea if if you are failing that means you are showing the world that uh, this is the way that will not work 
okay like edison uh, also famously said i have discovered 100 uh, ways uh, in which a bulb cannot be created right so similarly you are also creating by your negative results you are also uh, making uh, you know uh, finding uh, that is going to be useful for the uh, future researchers so again negative results should not be taken as a, a discouragement and uh, you should not uh, you know focus on the negative results only okay coming back to our uh, reviewing uh, now uh, uh, once we have identified the gaps uh, in the uh, sorry once we have identified what methods were carried out what methods were used by the researchers we need to um, understand why they have used this particular method only and why not something else by doing this we will be able to identify the importance or significance of that particular or those particular methods that were used by the uh, researchers or the authors now uh, what will happen is that uh, if a particular method was used by a particular researcher in their work and you feel that you may improvise on that method you may improvise on the um, uh, that particular uh, 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 technique so then that is beneficial for you that is beneficial for you how is it beneficial for you because that way it gives you a direction to add novelty to your work because you know already what uh, the other person has done and if you are able to significantly improve that particular method so as to reduce the time so as to be cost effective so as to be eco friendly so as to be user friendly then you are doing a you are doing a novel work you are doing a novel work all right so after identifying the research uh, gaps in research you should conclude your findings conclude the findings of the review paper by adding what is lacking what is missing and what can be done what could have been done and what should be done in the upcoming times or in the future now this is a basic structure of a review paper or a good review paper if if we follow this uh, it is considered to be a good uh, uh, review paper now again coming back to our research work that we are going to carry out after reviewing since we have identified the gaps now we need to work on fulfilling those gaps and improving on the uh, lacunas if any or improving on the methods or processes of the earlier works that were carried out see most of the times uh, what we see uh, nowadays is uh, like research means one person is doing one thing in one particular and the same thing in the other population fine this is okay this is good but what is the improvement what is what what is new what new have you done see population wise variation studies can is they are fine but what new you are adding to the existing knowledge so this we need to think really well now next thing is the applicability in the real life now see uh, most of the research that is carried out that is okay the, that is very strong scientifically but when we talk about forensic science we need to understand that the research has to be carried out at the ground level the research or the output of the research should be beneficial to the ground force or to the actual field force that is working on the field do you agree with with it or not yes i think most of you would agree uh, see even if we do fancy research uh, but if it is not applicable on the actual scene of crime if it is not um, going to be used by a, a you know police officer or a investigating officer then it holds uh, quite you know less uh, value in actual real life scenarios so we should work on uh, we should focus on working on such problems that are more relevant to the current situation or the current context okay now uh, another important aspect is uh, you know probability now probability is one such uh, thing uh, that is always there 
and the probability and uncertainty are two such things actually that are always there in the in research or in anything that we do now uh, in the indian context um, earlier probability was not given too much weightage but nowadays uh, we are also learning we are also adapting we are also in uh, improvising ourselves and we are we have started using probability uh, and we have started using uh, such techniques and methods so as to reduce uncertainty to increase our accuracy of the results all right so this also needs to be you know taken care of this also needs to be understood now uh, uncertainty can also be term uh, termed as variabilities Uh, variability is also a type of uncertainty only now uh, how variability is important uh, what is the effect of variability this i'll tell you uh, with an example of uh, one of my own uh, research paper uh, okay we'll talk about it later now another important thing uh, that uh, we should you know remember nowadays is the selection of the journal see if we are going to publish our research we should know we should understand what type of journal is going to publish such article if not then we should search for this that part, those particular types of journals where, wherein our uh, articles are most relevant and the articles would receive maximum coverage maximum coverage means the readers of that journal must be you know able to access your uh, uh, article access your work and this will increase your visibility on the scientific platform this would ultimately result in you know benefiting you and your organization where you are working your university your institute your college because if your work is visible if you have selected good journal your work will get high visibility if your work is visible uh, across the globe more and more people would be you know following your work more and more people would be joining your work and you will receive good number of citations okay so uh, that way again selection of journal is very important now a uh, collaboration collaboration is another important aspect that has been missing from um, you know our field Uh, for quite some time now because uh, we are hesitant to collaborate we are hesitant to collaborate with uh, the other researchers in the field we are hesitant to collaborate with the other uh, experts in the field um, i don't know exactly the reason why but at times the reason may be that people may feel that why should i why should i i am self sufficient i am sufficient enough i am sufficient enough to uh, you know work on this particular topic and uh, uh, i don't need anyone's help but that should not be the case actually okay collaborations are very important as it brings um, you know different experts from different fields together and we can uh, uh, we can you know utilize their expertise in our work okay so having collaborations is also uh, uh, important thing in when specifically and especially when we are talking about interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary research all right now output uh, if we are able to follow all these things if we are able to understand this and if we are able to inculcate all this into our research then the output that we get would be amazing would be tremendous see all these things that i am telling you these are not just you know uh, 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 words uh, these are all uh, these all things i am talking based on my experience my own experience i started uh, you know uh, doing research in uh, say 2011 uh, as soon as i joined as an assistant professor at uh, my present institute or institute of forensic science Uh, i started you know doing something something i started with some simple papers and they they were published in some simple uh, uh, indian journals uh, at first i didn't know the importance of you know uh, indexed journals and indexing and all all these things were not known to me so i took some time 
I try to understand what goes on and what uh, different things are uh, there. What are the different indexing services? What is Scopus? What is PubMed? What is Medline, um, et cetera. Uh, so uh, what is SCI? So all these things were not known to me earlier. So early in my earlier days, uh, in the earlier days of my career, I have published researches in uh, Indian journals and that were not indexed in anywhere. And uh, they claimed to be international. They had that name international in their name. So as uh, any one of us would have, I also had the same feeling and I also published in those journals, but it is not wrong to publish in those journals unless they are following the scientific norms. If they are getting your articles reviewed properly and they are following the peer review process, then it is fine to publish in these as well. But again, uh, these journals will not give you so much visibility because they will remain lost in the you know crowd. But if you, once you start publishing in good journals, you get high public, uh, uh, visibility and your citation increases like anything. Uh, now, I don't know whether you, uh, you are aware of it or not, but most of you would know of Google Scholar, right? Google Scholar, uh, ha, you know, nowadays is becoming very popular. It has uh, um, uh, indexing service. It is the indexing service of Google, wherein all the different articles that are published are indexed. So it also maintains the record of the number of citations that uh, you have received uh, for, uh, you know, your papers. It uh, identifies your email address, your name, and it uh, automatically adds your papers to your profile. Also, it uh, um, gives you an option to add your own papers that are not uh, there online. Uh, you can add them to your profile. And uh, it tracks the number of uh, papers that are citing your research. So it tracks the number of citations. So now, I'll show you very briefly my own research profile and some of the papers, some of the important papers that I feel uh, were a good example of multidisciplinary research and uh, where, uh, you know, I have inculcated all these uh, uh, fine points that I have just mentioned. So this is my Google Scholar profile. Uh, now, um, if you don't know about it, you should research about H index and I10 index. Okay, I10 index means uh, at least these many papers means if I10 index is 19, this means at least 19 of my papers have at least 10 citations each. H index 16, 16 means at least 16 of my papers have minimum 16 citations. Okay, and these are my total citations till date. Now, uh, this is one, one of my earliest papers. Uh, of uh, me and uh, Neeti madam, and we have done this work. Now uh, we have, uh, you know, done this work. So people would say that, okay, it is, uh, again, we know rich density, how it is calculated and all, we know it. But earlier, uh, what we identified was, there was a small uh, gap in the uh, uh, earlier works or earlier researches. What was the gap? The gap was the rich density was being measured from the fingerprints at any random places. The position was mostly not fixed. So if the position is not fixed, then we come back to our term that I was going to talk to you about uncertainty or probability and then specifically in that variability. Now variability would increase. If you don't have fixed area, if you don't know the fixed point where you have taken the rich density from, if you are not able to identify it once again, then what will happen if you do uh, you take the measurements again, then there will be difference. If someone else takes the measurements, then again, there will be difference. So there would be inter observer and intra observer variability. So for us, it is important to avoid inter -observer variabilities by what can go wrong. Okay we can narrow down the variations, we can narrow down the uncertainty to solidify our results. See, this was what we did uh, from the core, we measured five millimeter and then on the both on the left and the right side, we measured the rich density. So this point is fixed. If we get the core, if we place this uh, point or the center, uh, the core in on this particular point, and then we measure the rich density. So each time, will get the same result. So the inter-observer and inter-observer variability 
was uh, you know very less or negligible in this particular condition and also quite a few um, uh, you know stats uh, and uh, statistical tools were used in this uh, particular work so it was a good learning point for us uh, then again now lip print distribution of lip print and uh, the six differences in the stability so again this paper was also published in a good journal uh, it's uh, of elsevier uh, saudi journal of biological sciences and nowadays it has uh, approximately an impact of 2.5 or uh, 3 something so again uh, this was used here in uh, see when we talk about lip prints uh, the most of the methods were using stick on the subjects then again there are many issues uh, there were many issues like the repeatability of the results the repeatability of the findings was there right? because when we apply lipstick okay to fill the um, uh, grooves that are present on our lips first thing second thing to apply the lipstick we tend to you know pout we tend to pout right and that again uh, create some false um, uh, characteristics of lip lip prints and uh, that again is going to be difficult for us to identify in actual scenario so what we did was we did we used digital photography or photography for uh, you know um, uh, getting these uh, lip prints so in that condition the lips were in the natural uh, position or natural condition there was no pouting and uh, there were uh, um, you know, good results and uh, it was uh, published after quite some time in this uh, journal. Now this is a recent work. Now uh, when we talk about multidisciplinary research, we also need to understand that as a forensic expert or as a forensic scientist, we also need to think of socially relevant topics. So now this is one such topic that was uh, socially relevant. Uh, we use uh, different uh, food products like jalebi, laddu, etc. And uh, they may have some adulterants present in them. So, uh, synthetic food color metanol yellow was detected in this work by using different uh, instruments and different methods. And this was also published in uh, a, a journal by Springer, uh, that is JPC, Journal of Planar Chromatography, Modern TLC. Uh, Next, uh, this is a topic that is very important. Uh, that is forensic DNA evidence from crime scene to conviction. So for in this, uh, you know, this is a chapter in a, a edited book, uh, wherein we have uh, mentioned that uh, what are the different steps that should be taken to avoid, you know, contamination and cross contamination, while, uh, you know, uh, throwing some light on uh, the critical aspects of forensic DNA. Uh, what uh, can be done, what should be done, how the chain of custody should be maintained, uh, what should be done from the point of, uh, you know, lifting the evidence from the scene of crime till the time the evidence is uh, presented in the court of law. So all this is covered in uh, this particular chapter. Uh, now, this is uh, a very uh, high point in my career because uh, this is one paper uh, that is uh, totally interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and uh, it was uh, published in the uh, very prestigious journal the lancet uh, it has an impact factor of 60 60 plus so uh, those of you who know would understand the importance of uh, this kind of papers in the high point in my career to have uh, published in uh, such an internationally reputed and uh, globally well-renowned journal. Uh, now talking about the output, uh, total till now uh, from my team or my six chapters that published and eight are in process, actually they are finalized, but they are uh, undergoing review process and uh, revisions and some are in press. Okay, uh, total uh, 42 research papers, research and review papers uh, we have published. Uh, two books, edited books are in process. Uh, we have delivered over 180 plus invited talks and workshops to different colleges, institutes, universities, and to police officers. Uh, the areas that we focus on, again, you can see the variety here. Crime scene investigation, 
prints, latent prints, fingerprints, palm prints, footprints, forensic anthropology, forensic dermatographics, food forensics, forensic toxicology, epidemiology, forensic nanotechnology, biosensors, DNA forensics, etc. So I think I have uh, exceeded my time by two, three minutes, but uh, given the fact that we started a bit late, so I think uh, this should be fine. And uh, I would like to say in the end that success is not final. In the words of Winston Churchill, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So we have continued despite of all the drawbacks and you know all the busy schedules and uh, all the problems that we face in our life. Uh, we have continued and we have got good results. Uh, we have uh, publications in uh, different reputed journals such as Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine, uh, Forensic Science Research, um, uh, then Egyptian Journal of Forensic Sciences, The Lancet, The Nature, The Nature Medicine, etc. So I wish you all the best. I wish that uh, you should not be limited by your failures and uh, you should uh, keep your courage and uh, you should continue. Fight hard, stay strong and uh, work towards achieving your goals. Let people not dictate terms for you. Let uh, you, know, you, you be the leader and you lead uh, from the front. Thank you. That's it from my end. And also I'd like to mention that uh, my institute, that is Government Institute of Forensic Science Nagpur, is the only forensic science institute in India to be ranked in the 101 to 150 rank band in colleges category in the prestigious NIRF 2020 rankings. So I'm again proud to be associated with this institute. And uh, it has been a privilege speaking at this uh, forensic agora for the Galgotia's Galgotia University. Uh, thank you once again to the organizers, to the whole team, and uh, especially to Vinnie Madam for inviting me uh, to deliver this uh, talk uh, on this very important uh, topic that is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary research in forensic science. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would now like to request our participants to please raise their hands if they have any queries for Ashri sir. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, then moving on, uh, I would now like to request Ms. Neha Yadav to please present the virtual salutation to Dr. Ashish Bhatia. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and sharing your knowledge about the interdisciplinary research in forensic science. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, sir, I would like to request you to kindly accept the gratitude. Thank you so much, madam. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. With this, we conclude day one of the faculty development program. Hope you have gained some insights on the topics presented today by our marvelous speakers. For, uh, I would like to extend my gratitude for each and every one who tuned in today. And don't worry, we still have four days of unlimited knowledge and all inspiring topics lined up for you. Until then, please stay safe and take care.